I invite you to turn with us this morning to the book of Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, as we continue studying some of the practical instruction that Paul gives to believers in the latter portions of the book of Colossians. We've now been in this book together for, this is our 16th message from this book, the first Two chapters, if you recall, were so very doctrinal and Christological, as Paul speaks so powerfully about the identity of our Savior, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, being the incarnation of the second person of the Godhead, God incarnate, God manifest in human flesh. And he also warned about some of the great problems that face this church in Colossae, certain false notions such as legalism or asceticism or replacing the worship of Christ with the uh, worship of angels or anything that is other than God and glory. And as you have noticed over the past couple of messages together, we've begin, begun transitioning into some very, very practical instruction, edifying instruction that's beneficial for God's people. Today, our study will be of the Christian home, or perhaps we could consider this a summary of the roles of people in the home. In other words, maybe putting this another way, if the Apostle Paul had a single admonition to mothers or a single admonition to fathers, a single admonition to children, what we find here in Colossians chapter 3 would be that single admonition. Now, why do we say that? There are many passages, many places in the New Testament and the Old Testament as well where an apostle, Paul or Peter or the Lord Jesus in his sermons, might speak to a greater exhaustive depth concerning the role of a father or the role of a mother, the role of children in the homes, the blessing of having little children in the church of the Lord with us in our midst. All of those things are discussed in Scripture. But here in Colossians in chapter 3, Paul being brief, he simply lists one thing to mothers, one thing to wives, one thing to husbands, presumably the fathers in the homes, as he would reference children and fathers in verses 20 and 21. If he had one thing to say to the youngsters in a home, what would it be? And then lastly, verse 21, we'll consider the role of a father to train up and discipline his children, but at the same time, not provoke them, not abuse them, and certainly not to be so overbearing that, as we'll emphasize later, to extinguish that light that is in their young eyes. We'll begin by reading verse 18 and continuing through verse 21. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Now, as we've read that to you, I want to give you a few thoughts up front by way of a preface, if you will, three thoughts specifically The first thing that I want to answer is the question, Pastor, you've just introduced a thought about wives and husbands and children and fathers. What if I'm a single man of 22 years old? What if I'm a a woman who perhaps is a widow who's no longer married of 75 years old? What if I'm not a wife or a husband or a child in the sense of someone who's not yet an adult? How does this message apply to me? What benefit is there for me in this message? Well, first of all, if you're an aged person and you have children or grandchildren, you need this information, even if you're a widow or a widower, you need this information for your children and your grandchildren. Now, if you're a grandparent, your grandchildren need this information. You might have grandchildren that don't receive this information from their parents, and so where are you going to receive this information? Where are they going to receive this information? They're going to receive it from you. Just thinking back in my my own personal family history, when my dad was a boy, both of his parents were 
off partying. They divorced at a very young age. It was a very broken home, but it was a faithful grandmother who basically adopted him and his older sister and carried my father to church. Now, he departed from the faith, as a lot of people do when he was in his late teens and early 20s, but in his late 20s and early 30s, God worked very powerfully in his life and drove him to his knees quite literally, and the man went back to his roots, that which he knew as a young child, and ended up pastoring the church, as you very well know, that his grandmother had taken him to as a boy. So if you're a grandparent and you think, I'm a widow or I'm a widower, I don't, I don't have a wife or a husband, I don't have children in the home anymore, just understand that this information is useful for you to pass on. Because as we read in the book of Titus chapter 2, the aged women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. It's our responsibility to mentor those who are younger. If you're an older person, and that's your role in the house of God. You know, we like to replace the roles of individuals in the church today with seminars and conferences and books and podcasts. But let me just tell you, uh, aged sisters, aged brothers, you're far more effective in the life of a young person than a conference or a book or a pamphlet or a podcast. You can give them one-on-one -on -one instruction and patterning that they can't get anywhere else. And God has seen fit to build that into his church. And a lot of Americans don't understand that today which is one of the reasons that the church doesn't have the power in the world that it used to have as far as the changing of lives around us. You'll need this information for your children and grandchildren, younger people in the church. If you're young and you're not married, and a lot of our youngsters are not here today because of illness and other things, one day you'll very likely be married, more than likely. Now, what's so crazy about this, and I just want to leave the, the notes for a minute and encourage you. Young folks, I want you to have the mind to grow up and get married. That seems strange to say, especially from a pulpit, to have the mind to grow up and get married. You know, young people get married less and less in today's time. It doesn't mean they don't live with someone. They move in with boyfriend, girlfriend, live with them a year or two, break up, move in with someone else. Let me just tell you, young folks, have the mindset because God, from the beginning, has created male and female to be husband and wife, to be a couple, have the mind to grow up and be married. Now, along those lines, let me balance that. You want to select someone for your spouse that is a godly person? Scripture gives one requirement for a spouse, for a Christian, and that is that they must marry another Christian. Now, I say one requirement. Some things go without saying. If you're a young man, you should marry a young woman. Used to, you didn't have to give that disclaimer. But the person must be a Christian. And, and beyond that, well, if you like them, then go get married. Now, along those lines, I've known young people who, well, this young lady has, you know, grown up in a church her whole life, and she wants to get married, and so the young men that she has to, the requirements a young man has to have for her to marry them is they have to have the income of her father, the spiritual maturity of the pastor, and the good looks of a Hollywood celebrity. And, and might I just say, you, you might be single till you're 35 or 40, if that be the case. There are very few Prince Charmings, and you have to remember in mythology and fables, Prince Charming sometimes began as a toad. Find somebody, fall for them, get married. If God blesses you with children, have as many of them as you, as you can stand and have a wonderful time together and make it an adventure. So many times in our, in our culture, marriage is discouraged, especially to young people. Well, you need to go to college first. Well, Jesus didn't say you have to go to college first. It's okay if you do, but you don't have to. Rachel and I both got degrees married together, and I was making $10 an hour at one time living in an apartment. You could do that back then, and truth be told, if you live without a lot of the junk we think we can't live without today, you could get by on a whole lot less than we think we have to have. We both got our college degrees married. We had Ethan, then we had Lydia, and God blessed. We look back on it as some of the most fond times in our lives, and that's another lesson, young folks. You don't realize you're in the good old days 
until they're no longer the good old days. And truth be told, you'll always look back at times of your life, regardless of the time of your life, with great fondness. If we could live to 200 years old, we'd be thinking back at 125 or 150 or 175 because every season of life has its own distinct individual blessings that we look back on with nostalgia and with fondness. If you're young, Lord willing, you'll be married one day, and as you're married one day, you need this information. So don't zone off and say, well, he's talking to mom and dad. He's not talking to me. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. If you're eight years old, I'm talking to you. If you're four years old, I'm talking to you. If you're 85 years old, I'm talking to you. Because Scripture gives this, and we can all make use of this in one way or another. Number two, as our preface, as we approach this subject of the Christian home, the role of the wife, the role of the husband, the role of children and parents... I want us to take special note of verses 17 and 23. You'll notice that we didn't read verses 17 and 23. We read verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, verse 21. But I want you to notice the book ends on each side of this passage contain a principle that if you understand and apply whatever you do in your marriage, your marriage is going to be more blessed. Notice the principles on each end, the exhortations on each end of this passage. Verse 17, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Now, this isn't just verbiage to take up space. It's not just some ceremonial thing or sanctimonious thing that Paul throws in here just to add extra or maybe icing on the cake. He's giving you the secret to a happy life. Whatever you do in this world, do it as if you're doing it in the name of God. And so as a husband, rather than being a good husband because, well, I'm supposed to be a good husband, I want to be a good husband in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to Love my wife, as we'll see in a minute, the way Jesus Christ loved the church to his praise, to his honor, and to his glory. What's the motivation then for being a good husband? The Lord Jesus Christ and my relationship with him. You wives are to submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And that phrase, as unto the Lord, is often just left off of that because everyone that's a chauvinist loves that word that begins with S, submit. But you submit as unto the Lord. You submit to your husband as if you are submitting to him standing in the place of Christ, which in in the marriage, the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. The bookends of this exhortation involve doing this to the glory of God. Verse 23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Now we know when we stand before God in glory at the end of time, we're not judged based upon the things that we've done. That would be a terrible thing because we're all sinners. We're judged based upon the life of Christ. He has given us his righteousness. But here in our lives, we receive according to what we have done. A man will always reap what he has what? Sown. What grows in your garden is based upon what you planted in your garden. If I live a life of folly, then I'm going to yield the results of a fool. But if I live my life to the glory of God, if I do all that I do as unto the Lord Jesus and not as unto men, well, I'm going to have blessings in my life. Notice that this principle of the Christian home that we share with you this morning is built around, literally between, in this epistle, the principles of doing all unto God as unto God for God's glory. Now, as we observe here from verse 24, there is reward and blessing in what we do. There's so much motivation in God's word for me to be a good husband Do you want a happy marriage? Do you want your children to go out in the gates and defend your name and your honor and your cause as we read from Psalm 127 in our scripture reading this morning? Do you want your wife to call you blessed? You you women, do you want your children to rise up and call you blessed like the virtuous woman? 
Do you want the respect of your children, husbands, the respect of your wife, wives, the loving adoration of your husband and your children? Yeah, I think we do. That's a personal benefit, isn't it? But beyond the desire for me to receive personal benefit, the chief desire I should have in framing my marriage and the relationship I have with my children and even my parents after the pattern of the Word of God should be to bring God glory. And so, yes, this is a benefit to me if you put these practices, these principles into practice in your home. Your home will be blessed. It will be more peaceful, especially if both husband and wife are on board. It's kind of hard if you have a poor woman living with a tyrant, and it's very difficult if you have a godly man man living with a contentious woman. And the book of Proverbs says a whole lot about that. You know what it says it's better to be homeless in the wilderness than to be a husband living with a contentious woman? He's not being silly in in, uh, Proverbs, Solomon. And he would know a lot about that because he had 700 wives. You say, I thought he was the wisest man who ever lived. It went downhill real quick. Princesses, pagans, women who worshipped other gods. And because of that, they led his heart astray. He became an idolater. And because of that, there was civil war because God wouldn't allow his children to rule over all 12 tribes. That's how Israel became the northern and southern kingdom. It's a whole lot easier to put these principles into practice if you have a husband and a wife who were united after this sole purpose of bringing God glory in their marriage and being a blessing one to another and to their children. That's the ideal. That's what we want. We want it to be ideal. Number three, preface. I warn you now not to take these principles to an extreme to justify mistreatment or abuse. I can tell you that every single abusive man who claimed to be a Christian will stand on verse 18 of Colossians chapter 3 and scream, Wives, submit, while the entire time they're mistreating their wife, speaking down to their wife, abusing their wife. Might I just say... That a wife who is subject to her husband is no slave. You sisters are not slaves. And a husband, to put this perhaps on the flip side, a husband is not to be manipulated by the wife, if you really love me, you'll X, Y, Z. These principles are not given to us to abuse or manipulate the other person in our home. Have you ever heard of both of those? The husband who is cruel to the wife saying, you have to submit to me or else, and the wife who says to her husband, maybe even in things that are not good, if you really loved me, you would do X, Y, Z. We don't use these to abuse, neither do we use these to manipulate. And as we get to this principle about fathers provoking not your children to anger, obviously that eliminates abuse from the equation of discipline in the home. But while parents are to discipline, they are never to abuse. And we'll end off the preface with, if you're an abused wife, if you're abused by your husband, you need to leave and call the police. Because the place for that abusive husband is behind bars. And I can tell you this, if that husband happens to be a member of the church, you can bring him before the church and we will excommunicate him if he will not repent. That is a fact. If children that you know are abused, might I encourage you to call DHR and report the abuser? Did you know as a pastor, I'm a mandatory reporter in the state of Alabama? That means if I know that a child is being abused, by law, I have to report that abuse or I can go to jail. A lot of pastors don't even understand such laws as that exist. But I'm a mandatory reporter. I take that very seriously, the abuse of children. If somebody abuses a child, I will be the first person to report them to the authorities. Let's begin going through this text and our exposition for today. How's that a 20-minute preface? It could be 40. And we'll just say we're we're going to summarize these principles. We're not going to give a message out of each of them. Sometimes we do, especially if we're going through the book of Ephesians or Peter's writings, because you have statement after statement after statement, and 
As with everything else we've looked at in Colossians, here we are, middle of the third chapter, the end of the third chapter, and we're 16 messages in. All of these principles can be unpacked as series of their own. But for the sake of time in this series and brevity, we're simply going to express to you the thoughts that Paul tries to bring to our attention in this epistle. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as is fit in the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. This might be in the top five most hated principles in the entire Word of God. Submit to a man, and you could just hear the words rolling off the tongue. How dare you, God forbid! Well, we, again, don't want to use this principle to justify abuse or to somehow diminish the beautiful role of a wife and a mother in the home. But we have to remember that God created marriage, and every institution in the world has a structure of rank within it, marriage being no exception. God creates marriage all the way back in the Garden of Eden. He made Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. God brings every animal past Adam. Adam names every animal in creation. But mysteriously so, in a creation that God himself said it is good, yea, very good, God says it is not good that the man should be alone. Humans are social creatures from the very beginning, even before sin, with the need for companionship. And so God makes a help meet for him. And that word meet there, those are two words, help meet. We've, in modern contemporary English, combined the two as the word help meet. But it's actually a phrase here, a help meet for him. The word meet means fit or appropriate. I will make a helper appropriate for this man, Adam, that I have made in my image, a special creation. Unlike any other man that's ever lived, God personally formed him from the dust of the ground. And so God causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He opens up the flesh. This is literally what we call modern-day surgery. He causes a deep sleep to fall upon him. He takes a rib from him, from this rib, He forms this woman and presents this woman unto the man. And he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. They twain were one flesh, and that's the structure of marriage from that time forward. But God created that marriage with a hierarchy of authority. Now, what did we begin with in our preface and disclaimer? This does not mean that men get to be rude, tyrant jerks in the home, nor does it mean that women are slaves. Does a three-star general look at a four-star general with disgust because one more star is on his shoulder? Do the president and vice president of this country have arguments and debates over which one of them has more authority? No, it's simply a given that there is rank. How about the CEO of a company and the chairman of the board? There's rank everywhere you go. Everywhere in life there is rank. From a musical perspective, you have principal and then you have the second chair and you have the third chair. And depending on how many instruments you have, you have one person that is in charge. Now, by the way, just from personal experience, the better caliber of musician that you have as a person in charge the better the band is going to be, and the more peaceful the band is going to be. The better quality of the man who is the head of the household, the better quality and caliber of the peace of the home will be. That's certainly a principle. But there is rank in the home. And as such, as Paul writes to wives, Christian wives, what is God's will for my life as a wife, you might ask? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. The word submit here means simply to yield. Now, by the way, yielding is a good thing. There's a metaphor that we often say when someone's maybe usurping authority that they don't have, and it's stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. You ever hear that? Stay in your lane. I like to think of that word submit and its synonym yield, and that's one of the definitions of this Greek word. 
and relate it to driving, if we have no yield signs and you just go blistering out into another road, you're going to slam into another car, there's going to be chaos, there's going to be carnage, there's going to be damage. But if you simply yield and then pull out in traffic as you're supposed to, there won't be things such as car accidents, there won't be the destruction that could be. This word submit literally means to yield. Now to balance that thought, wives submit or yield to your husbands, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, the role of the husband in the household. Any husband with any sense whatsoever is going to consider his wife's thoughts, desires, and counsel her approach to a situation because they are going through life as a team. Husbands, if you want to know the secret to happiness in a home, don't disregard your wife. I can't tell you how many things that have happened in our home where I will stop and ask Rachel, get a little different perspective, change the way I was going to approach things, and it turned out a whole lot better than it would have been had I disregarded her. Yes, the wife is to submit to her own husband, but at the same time, any good leader... Any good president's going to listen to his vice president, right? How about his chief of staff, his cabinet? In fact, in the multitude of counselors, their safety. No husband, with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our husband as the bride of Christ, has enough wisdom to go through this life without asking someone else for their thoughts. We need the thoughts of others. And husbands, God has sent your wife into your life as a help appropriate for you God has a lot of confidence that, for lack of a better word, that in this marriage structure, husbands ought to be asking their wives for what their opinion is on a matter. And by the way, there are issues in our home that I think we just renovated the or, or rearranged the bedroom with different furniture for about the eighth time since we've lived here. I don't even care. You know, there are husbands that get all dictatorial about that sort of thing, and I'm, I'm just like, Why? And it really comes down to, well, they just like to control other people and don't want anybody doing anything without their say-so. Well, that's not the key for making anybody happy, including yourself. Now, there's, there's wisdom in a man understanding that his wife is made in God's image with intelligence and wisdom and value and virtue. And as two Christians engage together as partners in a home... They value each other's thoughts and input. Now, that being said, submit means to yield. Any husband with any sense is going to consider his wife's counsel, her likes, her dislikes, her desires. He wants her to, as we'll see in a minute, to be fulfilled and nurtured. The final say in the home lies with the husband. That's not popular today, but I'm not in a popularity contest. The final say lies with the husband. Why? Because God holds him accountable as the head of a house. You see, husbands are the head of their respective houses the way Christ is the head of his church. That's a very, very important role, is it not? It's a very specific role. When a husband fails to live up to his responsibility in the home, God holds him accountable for that. That's terrifying, men. Amen? That is a terrifying thought to know that God has placed me in that role, and if I fail, I not only introduce destruction into my household, but I let the Lord down who has called me to fill that role. The husband has the final say because God has made him head of the house and God holds him accountable. Husbands ought not take that as a power trip, but again, it's outright terrifying. You know, when a company gets busted for things that are wrong and it was a problem that went all the way up to the top, whose head rolls? Who goes to jail in the Ponzi scheme? Well, it's the CEO. Years ago, I went to the it's so funny how fickle human beings are. I went to the Scrooge campus at Jefferson State Community College down in Shelby County, and it was 
speculated that he had done some shady things and he was prosecuted, all of a sudden all them letters were scraped off that building and the word Shelby went there instead, instead of Scrooge. It was now the Shelby campus. Well, it was a Scrooge campus when I went to it. But he was a CEO, he was incarcerated, and his life steered off course in a hurry. Who goes to jail? The janitor? No. The person that goes to jail in a corrupt business structure is the CEO or the CFO. Dads, if we're the head, if we're the head and something goes wrong, who is it that's judged for that before anybody else? Me. It's gonna, if it happens under my watch, then I'm the one that's going to have to live with the consequences of my actions or inactions. Now, as is fit in the Lord, this word fit literally has reference to something that is due. As is fit in the Lord means, wives, you yield to your husband, you submit to them. They are the head of the house. The final say is with him because God holds him accountable. And so, as is fit refers to something that is due. And so, as we think about things that are due, think about, number one, a bill. It's fitting, it's proper, it's due. And if you don't pay it, usually bad things happen. And two, the word that is uh, used here, do, can also have reference to when a magistrate or a king or a prince deserves certain honor, that honor is due unto them. And so if a king walks into the room, husbands, I'm not saying your kings and your wives have to do this. If you, if you try to spin this and say that, shame on you. I'm on record saying this is not what I mean. But when a king walks into the room in the old days, what does everyone have to do in that room? Well, they salute, they bow, because royalty has entered the room. There is a king that is now in the room, and their honor is due unto them. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as is fit. That word as is fit means literally it's due them. It is due them to be respectful to not be rude or crass, to not put them down, to not nag them, to not complain at them incessantly, but simply to respect them. Other scriptures speak about the wife as being the keeper of the home. and We won't turn to those, but the word keeper means a guard, and it's the same word that's used when Paul was in a prison, and the keeper did tremble. You wives are prison guards of all those little children that live in your home. Now, in all seriousness, you're the one that keeps those negative influences out. It's your job to chase away the enemy. You are literally guarding your children during the day. You were the guard. And then as Paul would tell women that they are to keep the home, the word keep there means to manage. And so wives are the guard at home. Wives manage the home. It was laughing. Uh, it was a laughing thing the, a few years ago. There was some major study that came out and you know, secular papers were just astonished and as they learned that statistics and studies and science has proven that women are better managers of the home than men. Gee, it's almost like Paul said that 2,000 years ago. Women do that well. Women do that well. A few years ago, I went and stayed with a a friend of mine in college who is now married. I, I told him when he, excuse me, he wasn't in college, he was in the Air Force. Um, went and stayed with a friend as we were in college and he had joined the Air Force. He was in Shreveport at Barksdale and he was single, he was unmarried, he lived in an apartment off base. And we drive out there to stay with him and, you know, in our house we have a bedroom suit, and we have a living room suit, and we have a TV and a computer desk and, you know, China in the cabinets and utensils and food in the refrigerator. We go there and we go out there and stay with him. And there's a computer desk and a computer, and there's a mattress in the floor. There's a TV sitting in the corner. That was it. I'm like, man, I really love what you've done with the place. All this open space, you know? Because there was literally no furniture in the room at all. There's a reason we'd be wise men as our wives or the managers of the home to take what they say seriously. They're often the ones that decorate. They sometimes, many times, keep up with the checkbook and the paying of the bills and the managing of the children's schedules, taking children here and there. Wives are exceptional at that. Those are some of the roles that Scripture would have us to 
recognized as the role of the wife, the guard, the manager. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, if you notice any time we talk about husbands and wives here at Flint River, no matter what passage we're in, we talk about husbands as we talk about wives, and we talk about husbands as we talk about husbands. Because I want to be very clear that we're not sharing with you some sort of oppressive, abusive system in the home, but there is a system of authority. Here we have Paul's one word. If he had one thing to say to husbands, rather than expounding and expanding on biblical principles, it's simply, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter. He tells you one thing to do, and he tells you one thing not to do. Husbands, first of all, love your wives. Now, I'm, I'm sure many bad husbands would immediately justify themselves by saying, well, I have an emotional attachment and a physical attraction to my wife. But I want you to understand that the biblical concept of love, men, does not mean that you are physically attracted to them or have an emotional fondness for them. Love scripturally means that you care and provide for them. In fact, as we expand on that momentarily from the book of Ephesians, you'll see that love has far more to do with what we are actively doing for our wives than it does what we feel inside for them. I want you to feel for your wife. I want you to have a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart for your wife. When she comes into the room, I want your pupils to dilate. I want her to take your breath away. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. We didn't plan this to be the Valentine's Day sermon. It happened anyway. God's providence is often a mysterious thing. But I want you to understand that when Paul says, husbands love your wives, that's not the main consideration or objective of this focus here. Let me give you some examples of love. Let's turn to the book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 13. In a moment, we're going to see the love of husbands compared to the love of Christ. Christ says... Of his people, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. Christ laid down his life, and the laying down of his life is the greatest example of love that the world has ever known. For God so loved that he gave his only son. The love of Christ is so great that nothing, height, depth, things present, things to come, life, death, or any creature from Romans chapter 8, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the type of love that God expects a husband to have for his wife. Now, if you can think in your mind, well, you know what, if some, somebody better came along or... You know, I, sometimes I wish she'd just leave me so we could get this over with and I could go shopping for somebody else. You are not loving your wife the way Christ loved his church because nothing could sever her, the church, from his hand. What does he say in John chapter 10? No man can pluck you out of my hand. Husbands, I want you to love your wives that way. Nothing can take you away from me. When we give those vows at weddings and we say, till death do us part, that's not a formality. For richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. So many times married people in this country are all about marriage when things are going great and when things begin to turn sour or there's difficulty or there's illness or maybe all of a sudden he goes bald. Oh, goodness, he used to be so handsome. His pants are five size larger and it's all in the navel. He doesn't have any hair on top. What's left is you know, gray. He's got more in his ears than he has on his scalp. It's just not the same anymore. Well, you know, we say for better or for worse for a reason. Now, I chose men because I'm a man. I could make silly little things like that to say about women getting old too. But women don't get old. They look the same as they ever did, you know. Amen? Amen. 
for better or for worse. Jesus says the love we ought to have for our wives is the type of love that he had for the church, and he would go to the cross after being scourged and beaten and mocked and put in three mock trials where they lied about him to go to Calvary and die for her when she was without strength and his enemy by nature, according to what he says in Romans. So think about that type of love, husbands. That's the love I'm supposed to have. Wow, I better get busy. How do you know it's the same type of love? Maybe you're just exaggerating. Well, in the sister epistle to this passage, Colossians, the book of Ephesians, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The love that I ought to have for Rachel is the love that Jesus had for his church, so much so that he would be willing to bleed and die for her. I ought to be willing to bleed and die for my wife. If I ought to be willing to bleed and die for her, I ought to be willing to live for her. Gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. If I'm a husband like Christ, then I care for the sanctification of my wife. I want her to be more holy. I want her to read the Bible. I want her to pray. I want her to be in worship because Jesus is concerned with the sanctification of his wife. Husbands, you're a spiritual leader in your home. Do you realize that? You're a spiritual leader in your home. You say, well, God didn't call me to preach. No, I'm not saying that you need to stand and preach an hour and a half discourse to her every night. She'd probably get tired of that pretty quick. But you need to lead them in the Word. You need to pray for them and pray with them and be there and encourage them to be in God's house. Husbands, we set the tone for the spiritual condition of our households. Jesus went through all that to sanctify his bride, we ought to be concerned with the sanctification of our brides. So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Because remember, the church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Women ought to be loved by their husbands as the husband would love their own body. Now, this past week, I did something crazy. I bought a treadmill about a month ago, and I have been jogging every day. I told you guys, you ever see me run, something's chasing me? You remember that? Then I turned 40, and at 40, life is different. You don't see as well, you don't hear as well, and you have to do crazy things like use a treadmill so you don't die at 50 from a heart attack, and, and you have to eat green things that grow. This is all new to me. No man hated his own flesh. We do everything we can to preserve our life, our strength, our health. We go to doctors. We spend more money in the last decade of our life on health care than we did all the decades prior just to keep going another day. And that's what type of love we ought to have for our wives, men. To love our wives. To love our own Wives, as we love our own bodies, as we care for our own bodies and provide for our own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. If you hate your wife, you're literally hating yourself because y'all are one flesh. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Paul would say in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Husbands... You care for your own flesh, your own health, your own body. So ought you to cherish and nourish your wife, to care for her, to provide for her, to support her emotionally, spiritually, and also in every physical thing that she stands in need of. There's a reason that the Bible says if a man doesn't provide for his own, he is worse than an infidel. We are to provide because we are to fill the role of Christ in our homes as husband and head, we're literally to emulate what it was that Christ is for the church. Be not bitter against them, Paul would say. This word bitter is interesting. It chiefly refers to taste and stomach displeasure. 
We read in Revelation where John eats something that is bitter to him, and it was bitter in his stomach. If you've ever eaten something and it, it upset your stomach, that word bitter can be used to describe that. But the word also can mean to exacerbate. We don't use that word a lot. What does it mean? It means to make a bad situation worse. Be not bitter to them means don't make a bad situation worse. Husbands, if you want to ruin something, if y'all are hostile together and you begin acting bitter, you're making a bad situation worse. What sort of an answer turns away wrath? A soft answer. If there's disagreement in the home and I start acting out in bitterness to my wife, I make a bad situation worse. This word bitter, also in the the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, one of the things that I like to do, if, if the word or a word is only used a few times in the New Testament, I like to see how modern or Greek speakers at the time of the writing of the New Testament would have used that word with reference to Old Testament concepts. And we'll just point out that the Septuagint is a very deficient translation of the Hebrew into Greek, and what the Bible uses, our English translations, is the Masoretic Hebrew. But you can learn some things about some of the Greek, lang- uh, the Greek words of the New Testament. That word has reference to when people grieve people, to when people are wrathful, to when people change their name from Naomi to Mara because they are so bitter at the Lord for things that have happened in their lives. It was interesting to study the usage of that word in the Septuagint and how they used it. That word means to be wrathful, It means to make a bad situation worse, and obviously then it means bitter, displeasant. Be not bitter, husbands, against your wives. By the way, I think that disrespect and bitterness are probably the two greatest threats to happy marriages in our world today. It's so easy for a wife to be disrespectful to her husband. It's so easy for a husband to be bitter and nasty to his wife. Christ has called us to more. He's called us to do better. Now, as we think about the roles of the father, other roles not mentioned here include working, providing, protecting, and also the discipline of children. Now, this is interesting. While we know wives discipline children too, because you're the keeper at home, if you're there with them during the day and the husband is at work and the children do things that are bad, mama's going to have to get a hold of them children. And to be quite honest, I got way more spankings as a kid from my mom than I did my dad. I made the mistake of laughing at her when I was about five years old. And the next thing I know, she had a flip-flop. And suddenly the game was on. Flip-flop, belt, little kid shoes you buy at Walmart, maybe a spatula at one point. Now, we didn't laugh at her anymore. But in Scripture, it's usually the fathers that are referenced as the disciplinarian. In Hebrews chapter 12, when we read about the Lord's chastening of us as his children, it's not compared to the discipline that the mothers gave, but the discipline that the fathers gave. The fathers are the one in the home who's accountable for that. Fathers are to discipline their children. And again, this is not an excuse to abuse Fathers are not to abuse their children. We'll consider that as we look at verse 21. And I'll also say that while a smack on the rear end can get the attention of a child that's popping off to you and disrespectful to you, there are many forms of discipline. Jesus, as our Lord, doesn't always discipline us in the same way. People miss sight of that. The Lord has a rod of correction, and yet he doesn't come down and literally hit us with a rod. Taking away smartphones is a great form of discipline for teenagers. In fact, honestly, my children would probably rather have a smack on the rear end. Oh, no. Hand me the phone. Hand me the tablet. Hand me the remote to your TV. I have to take all of that because they're smart enough to figure out how to put apps on the phone to control the TV. What? The keys to the car for a teenager are a powerful influencer. There are things that we can take away, the ability to see friends, hang out. I made C's on my report card once and missed one of my best friend's 16th birthday party. I was mad at my mom for two years. 
you know, it was good that I wasn't there because they burned down like five acres of a sage field. Good thing I wasn't there. I went out and sat in my truck and whined for two hours that night listening to the radio because I was not allowed to go for making a C on my report card. By the way, it didn't fix my report card. I made C's until I got out of high school because I was lazy, lazy, and bored. The fathers to discipline the children. Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 6. Now, as we wrap up what we've said about husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, I want to give you this statement to clarify. Loving your wives, husbands, as, is not contingent on her submitting to you the way Scripture says. Likewise, wives... Submitting to your husband is not contingent on him loving you the way that he ought to love you. Husbands love your wives because Jesus said husbands love your wives. Period. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Isn't contingent upon him loving you the way he ought to love you. But it's contingent upon Jesus saying, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. There's a lot of people in this world that say, well, I would be happy to submit to him if he were more loving to me. Scripture does not say that. And it doesn't say you know, to the husband, well, I really would like to love her, but all she does is gripe at me and give me a hard time and rake me over the coals and nitpick me and nag me. And listen, ladies, don't do that. But Scripture doesn't say, well, husbands, you get a free pass if they're really like that. No. Husbands, love your wives as unto the Lord. We'll continue this line of thought next week. We intended to today with verses 20 and 21, but we will pick it back up next week. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. How did we begin our message today? Whatever we do, we do all to God's glory. And so wives, as you submit yourselves unto your husbands, and husbands, as you love your wives and be not bitter against them, in all that you do, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Do you want a happy marriage? Well, I've just given you the secret to it today. It's not what the world sells. Let me just give you this little story in, in closing. Recently, there was somebody that raked uh, our family over the coals and, you know, said a lot of mean things about us. And I hate to say something like this in the pulpit within a year's time frame. I usually like to give it a year. By the way, I saw a meme. It said, be careful anything you say and can, uh, anything you say around me can and will be used as a sermon example. It's like your Miranda rights. You know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you can... Yeah, anything you say around a preacher can be used as a sermon example. But this person just raked us over the coals. That, that poor woman in that house with all those children just, you know, living in the shadow of her husband, just crammed in the home and stuck. And to me, it was just bizarre. But knowing the person, she has a completely secular view of what marriage is supposed to be. And she is absolutely miserable. You know who's not miserable? Rachel Winslet. Rachel Winslet's not miserable. How could you be miserable? All those children she stuck in the home with, she wanted. She loves. You've never seen that woman happier than when she was expecting a baby, have you? She glows when we were expecting. No, let me tell you. The world wants you to think you'll be happy if you follow their rules and you do marriage the way they say. All the while, their divorce rate is through the roof, and there are times when a Christian home ends in divorce because of the sin of one or the other or both, and that happens, and it's a shame. But when it happened, it's not because they obeyed, it's because someone disobeyed. The world wants to sell you their structure of marriage, and what they don't tell you is that it brings misery and depression and division and pain. If you want a happy marriage... Well, I've just given you the reason or the 
the way, the equation to achieving that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for telling us how to be better husbands and how to be better wives. Lord, we know that imperfect as the message and the messenger was, what you've given us in this word is so very perfect and true and right. And we thank you, Lord, for loving us enough as your bride to tell us how our homes can be the way they ought to be. We pray, Father, that our wives here in our midst would respect their husbands and yield as their husbands are the head of the household, but to be wise, women who make their husbands not ashamed and who love their children and love their husbands and teach other women how to be the type of wives they ought to be. And we pray, Father, that our husbands would emulate the Lord Jesus in their lives, that they would be good husbands, godly husbands, loving their wives, not just with emotional attachment and physical attraction, but that they would love them sacrificially, that they would have a desire for their wives' sanctification, that they would nurture and cherish their sweet brides. Lord, we pray that both people in every marriage in this home, both persons, that they would submit to you in all these things, that they would pattern their marriage after what your word says. And we know, Father, that if that happens, we know if that happens, their marriage is going to be blessed and there will be happiness because it will be right and it will be done as unto you for your glory in your name. And we pray, Lord, in thy son's holy name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures.